Hi, I'm Chris with Sanderson Test Prep, and in this video, we're going to talk a little bit about curve sketching. So let's take a look at a function, and let's talk about how we could come up with the graph for a function like this. So here we have f of x equals 1 third x cubed minus x squared minus 3x plus 4. Okay, so if this is our function, we want to take a look at how we can take this function and figure out what the graph is going to look like using a little bit of calculus. Obviously, we could do it with a calculator, graph it, and take a peek. And you can always do that in this section in order to check your work. But here, I want to talk through how we can use our first and second derivative, as well as our x and y intercepts to come up with a good representation of this function. So let's take a look at this function, starting with, let's find our first and second derivative because we're going to need them. And so if you find your first derivative here, when you multiply by 3 and reduce your exponent by 1, so you'll get x squared minus 2x minus 3. And the constant just becomes a 0. So that would be our first derivative. And our second derivative will be 2x minus 2. So those are good to have. Let's talk about how we're going to use those. So hopefully if you've already learned about finding extrema, we know that when we're finding extrema, we're going to set that first derivative equal to 0. And so let's take this first derivative. We'll use this. Start with that. And figure out some of our critical points so that we know how we can use that first derivative. So here, if your first derivative <clears throat> is going to be set equal to 0, to solve this, we check to see if this factors, and it does. We have x minus 3 and x plus 1 as our two factors. And so we would get x equals 3 and negative 1 as our critical points. Now with those critical points, so as a reminder from our finding extrema section, and if you haven't yet done that, feel free to check out our other videos on finding extrema. But you can put those points on a number line, and you can check values in between those and um, outside of those individual points. So here, if we wanted to test to find out if these are going to be minimum or maximum values, we can check point to the left of negative 1 in between negative 1 and 3, and then to the right of negative 3. And if we plug those into our derivative function, so let's see what kind of values we get. We don't really care about the numerical result. We just care about if it's going to be positive or negative. You're looking for the sign. So let's see. When I plug in a negative 2, this would be 4 plus 4, which is 8, minus 3 is 5. So that's a positive. And if you get a positive value, that means it has a positive slope. If I plug in a 0, I get negative 3, which means that's a negative value. You're going to have a negative slope in between negative 1 and 3. And so if you look, you can kind of visually see here that this looks like it's going to be a max. And then if I plug in 4, I get 4 squared is 16, minus 8 is 8, minus 3 is 5. So that's another positive value. So you're going to have positive slope there. So we can see that negative 1 is going to be a local max, and positive 3 is going to be a local min for that function. So you can start to see in here, after doing your first derivative test, the natural shape to the function is going to have this cubic shape to it, which we might expect from an x cubed you know, function to begin with. But let's see how the second derivative can help us figure out a little bit more about what that shape looks like. So here, if we take our second derivative, we're going to do our second derivative equal to 0. And what we're going to find when we do that, we're going to be finding something we call our points of inflection. And we'll talk about what those mean in just a sec. So here, we would get 2x equals 2 and x equals positive 1. So this would be your inflection point, and your second derivative, remember, anytime you take the derivative of any function, your derivative represents the rate of change. So when you take your first derivative, you're representing the rate of change of the original function, or as many of you already know, that's the slope. When you take your second derivative, you're identifying the rate of change of the first derivative, which means it's the rate of change of that slope. So not what is the slope, but how is that slope changing? Is the slope increasing or is the slope decreasing at a particular point? 
and the inflection point is going to be where you have that change, where the slope goes from decreasing in value and changes back towards increasing or vice versa. So here, if 1 is our inflection point, similar to first derivative test, we're going to test values to the left and the right of that. And if we plug in a 0 into our second derivative function, then we see that we get negative 2, so that would be a negative. And when we plug in a positive 2, we get 4 minus 2, which is 2, so that's a positive value. But these don't represent the slope like we saw before. Mm -mm. So it's going to be something a little bit different. This is going to represent what we call concavity. And so the concavity that we have here for these is going to tell you whether something is going to be concave up or concave down. It tells you when it's negative, it'll be concave down. And so that means it's going to have this downward arcing shape to it. And then when it's concave up, we're going to have this upward facing um, cave that opens upwards. So when you think of concavity, concave down means your cave. Think of it like a cave. Your cave is pointing down. And here, when it's positive, your cave is pointing up. And if we look at the concavity and compare that to what we saw here with our first derivative test, we can kind of see that right around 1, right, somewhere in between negative 1 and positive 3, is where we go from being concave down, where it starts to switch and starts to come back around and bend back up to be concave up. And that point where that change occurs is our inflection point that we calculated here by setting our second derivative equal to 0. So now we have those two values that tell us a little bit more about shape of the graph. And then just to put it all together, we can also, from our original function, we can always use this to find x and y intercepts to really complete our understanding of what this graph is going to look like. So for your x intercepts, you set y equal to 0. For your y intercept, you can set x equal to 0. And even though we already have a good understanding of this graph, if we do solve for your y-intercept here, it makes it a little bit easier to just add that extra data point. Your y-intercept on this graph would be equal to 4. It's just this constant over here, because when you plug in a 0 for x, you can cancel out the rest. So let's put all of these pieces together now into a graph and take a look at what this is going to look like visually. So here we have a graph from our first derivative test. Our critical points were at negative 1 and 3. So that's where we're going to have a local max and a local min, 1, 2, 3. And we know that our y-intercept is 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. And we know that at positive 1 is where our second derivative was equal to 0. That's where we're going to switch from concave down to concave up. So that means that our graph is going to look something like this. We're going to have this local max at negative 1 with a y-intercept at 4. And we want to figure out how high up this max is so that we can get an idea of shape is the max up here, and we have this really steep looking graph, right? Or is the max maybe, you know, down here just above four, and we have like a lighter turn. So in order to figure that out, to figure out what that actual coordinate is, we can plug negative one into our original function that we see here. And so when we do that, and I'll keep the original function here just so we can use it as reference. So for this, if we plug in a negative 1, that would give us negative 1 third. And here, maybe I'll, um, I'll move this graph down a little bit, I think, so that we can do this calculation right under the function. So here, f of negative 1 would be negative 1 third minus 1 plus 3 plus 4. So it'll be 6 minus a third, which is 5 and 2 thirds. So we get an idea of where that max value would be at negative 1, 
we would go up to five and two thirds. And then for our local min, we want to do the same thing. We want to find f of three for this function. So here that's 27 over three, which is nine, minus nine, minus nine, plus four. So those cancel and that would be negative five. So we know for that local min, by the time we get over to a positive value of three, we'll be down here at negative five. And that, with our point of inflection here at one, is going to be enough information for us to get a visual on what this graph, so here we're concave down, now we start coming back around. Now we start turning back towards concave up, and this will be the shape of our graph. So by using second derivative, we can come up with a more accurate graph of a curve for, in this case, a relatively complex function, but obviously in your class, I'm sure that you will see even more complex examples than that. For more, please check out our other videos. And